All right, so I want to go over quickly uh, this comment from Brett Favre. And uh, he says that, hey, I appreciate you going over this. And it's clarified a lot for me. My mom has been pushing me to become a priest in the Catholic Church. And I've always told her there is something off with that church. I try to tell her things like this and she just seems to get upset. She puts so much faith into the Pope when I know Jesus Christ is clearly the one to be exalted above all. Would love if you could go over anything else to help put things into a clear a clear perspective, such as the true church and sealed saints. Cheers. Alright, so, yeah, you know, there's a whole lot, really, quite frankly. Um, but in regards to the true church, um, let's sort of compare that with the Catholic Church and what it's built on. Okay, so you probably know this as well as I do, but let's take a, a closer look at exactly what they claim that uh, the Catholic Church is built on. Now, what they'll say is that Jesus gave Peter the keys to the church and that the, that the, that the church is built on Peter and they'll make claims like, well, Peter means rock. Well, okay. That's not what the scripture says at all. In fact, let's take a real close look at exactly what the scripture does say. Alright, so here in Matthew 16, Jesus, he's walking with uh, you know some of his disciples and he says, uh, he, he asks them, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, thou art, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Okay, well, let's stop right there. Okay. Let's focus on this right here. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Alright, so the what is the rock that the church is built on? It is the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what the church is built on. On. Now the Catholics will say it's built on Peter. All right, and they'll claim that Peter is the rock. And of course, uh, all they really do is they take advantage of people that don't know the Bible, that don't understand the Bible. Uh, but it's it's clear there in Matthew 16 that Jesus is referring to the fact that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
and that that's what the church is built on but we can go to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and read that and they all did drink of the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ all right so Jesus Christ has always been the rock all right and he there it you know this idea that Peter is the rock is uh, just is absolutely it's absolutely nonsense but I mean look they claim to have over one billion followers now I contend that this is one billion people that do not read their Bible let alone understand it okay so let's go take another look here at Matthew 16 when it says that um, blessed are thou Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven so this is important because this is God revealing it to Peter and this is not something that was revealed to him by man rather it was revealed by God so also for us to know what the rock is it must be revealed by God and not by man all right and so it's God that opens our eyes and opens our ears it's not man all right that's important I think to understand and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven now to me I, I don't know of any other way to um, sort of, uh, you know, explain this, I guess, uh, to reward it, I guess, other than to say that when we are born of the Spirit of God, we are a purchased possession, and when Christ returns, we are redeemed this is the day of our redemption and we will be um, changed into our glorified bodies we will essentially have everything that we could ever ask for um, I, <laughs> Uh, how do I say this um, what, right now we are limited right now we are in this mortal flesh but there's coming a time when we will be in immortal bodies and we will have the freedom to do anything and there will be no death, no sorrow, no pain, no suffering. So, what we're uh, here for is um, is for that time that is coming when all the things of this world will come to an end. And we will be transformed or transitioned into a perfect world where we ourselves will be perfect in every 
single way and we will have the ability to do all things all right now I hope I worded that okay all right so now we that are born of the Spirit of God we possess that same spirit now right now we have that same spirit we don't have that body of um, incorruption we don't have that body of immortality not yet but we do have that spirit of incorruption and we do have that spirit of immortality all right, so whosoever is born of God shall never die. All right, so that spirit of everlasting life is in us right now. So to give a long answer to this, this is what I think this means. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever we shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven so this applies to all of us that are born of God this is not only for one man um, you know whether it, you know, it was not only for Peter it was not only meant for, you know, some extremely rich and powerful man that is the head of the Catholic Church. That's not what this is about at all. Because all of us that are born of God have everlasting life no man has an advantage over another man in this world we see that men have tremendous advantage over other men in the life to come there will be no advantage over another all right okay and so I think uh, I, I shared this before I think in uh, Isaiah 65, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, this is a, it's a great example of that supports this. They shall not build houses, and how, what, wait a second, and and they shall not build houses and inhabit them. They shall not plant vineyards. No, that's not it. What am I looking for? Here we go. <laughs> they shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. All right, so in the life to come, we, you know, we're going to be living in a perfect world, right? A perfect world where no man has an advantage over another in any sort of way at all. We will all have eternal life life that lasts forever if one man had an advantage over another for all eternity that would be a curse and yet no man will be cursed in the life to come hereafter okay so that's an even longer explanation for how i view this all right so Let's examine this a little more. Okay, so thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. What's the church built on? The It's built on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, as we continue to read here in Matthew 16, we see that, oh, we'll go to verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again 
the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But then but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou saviest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Okay, so you think about that. If Jesus says, if, okay, let's play out the Catholic scenario, okay? So the Catholic claim is that Jesus is giving Peter the keys to the church, and therefore the church is built on Peter. All right. <laughs> Think about this. All right, so let's say now the church, because, and I give unto you the keys. All right, so Jesus gives Peter the keys, and now Peter has the keys. And five verses later, Jesus calls Peter Satan. All right, so now, just by this, the wording of all of this, we can very understandably conclude that the church, this church that's built on Peter, is the church of Satan. Okay? If the church is built on Peter, the keys are given to Peter, and Jesus calls Peter Satan, then that church is the church of Satan. Now it's interesting, when we go to the book of Revelation, we actually see here. Let me get to it. Oh no, I was there. Oh, well, let's see. It says, "And they worship the dragon, which is Satan." Okay. Which gave power unto the beast, which is the fourth kingdom, as I talked about this morning. That's the fourth kingdom of Daniel which is the kingdom of the of uh, the book of Revelation. It's the same kingdom or beast, however you want to phrase it. And that's the kingdom that we're in right now. All right, so this kingdom gets its power from Satan. All right, and just in, just in case you're... See, I don't like it when people confuse terms, and I'm not doing that here. I just want to, because people will use uh, Lucifer a lot. They'll talk about well, Lucifer this and Lucifer that. Well, Lucifer is only mentioned once in the entire Bible, and it's a proverb concerning the king of Babylon, and it should never be confused with Satan, in my opinion. There's no reason to. Just because Ozzy Osbourne sings about Lucifer doesn't mean we ought to confuse Lucifer with Satan. All right, so here in Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So here we got three words that mean the same thing. Serpent, devil, well, actually we got four, don't we? Serpent, devil, Satan, dragon, all meaning the same thing. And again, here in Revelation 20, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. All right, so here in Revelation 13, when it says they worship the dragon, it's referring to Satan, okay? The dragon, Satan, the devil, and the old serpent. It's all the same thing. All right, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, which is the fourth beast of Daniel, which is the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of this world is coming to an end when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. 
All right, and they worship the beast, saying, "Who is like? Uh, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him?" All right, so um, the point that I wanted to make here is that Satan is giving power unto the beast. Now, was there something else I wanted to share here? Um, oh, yeah, right there. Okay, so, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. All right, so in Revelation 13, when it, it's talking about the beast and the and its deadly wound, and the wound was healed, and he, this, ex, this other beast, um, this other beast is actually still the same beast. All right, he exercises all the power of the be of the first beast before him. Okay, so all this is the first beast in this scenario is the Roman Empire, and the wound that was healed is or the the second beast. Let's put it that way. The second beast is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. All right, so one good way to look at this is to see all the people that are worshiping their political leaders, whether it be left or right. It's the same thing. Okay, and so... Um, you see this in every country of the world where people have political leaders. They have a left and a right. All right. And so people are worshiping their government leaders. Okay. So he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. So they are worshiping their government or their political leaders. As in the same sort of way that they would back in the days of Caesar Augustus, where they worshipped Caesar as uh, the ruler of the world, basically, right? All right, so I was going to make a connection here. Let's see, where are we at here? That's not the way I want. All right, so um, so the connection I guess I was wanting to make here is that Satan is giving his uh, power to the beast, and that beast is also um, the great whore of Revelation 17. Which is, <laughs> to put it real simple, it's the Roman Catholic Church, okay? To put it real, real simple. In the entire uh, Bible, in all the prophecies that are talking about the end of the world and this um, Antichrist uh, kingdom, it's all pointing to... The Roman Catholic Church and this was foretold really from the beginning and clarified even so more in the book of Revelation in my opinion <laughs> than any other book in the, in the entire Bible but it lines up with everything that's written all throughout the Bible okay all right so in math in Matthew 16 here we see that in the scenario created that you know created by the catholic church the scenario that hey we're the church of god and that jesus has given peter the keys to the church and now all the popes are a succession of peter well they're not a succession uh, of peter rather a succession of Satan all right, and that's where they get all their power from all right so uh, not sure that that's the one point that I wanted to make is that the Catholic Church is built on Satan 
And the true church of God is built on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And there really shouldn't be any mistake about it, you know. Um, John 3, I think, is is a, just a great chapter. Jesus sa says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So whoever is born of God does not sin. All right. So let's do this. Uh, I'm going to show you real quickly here. Now the book of John and the three epistles of John is all the same John. And Revelation is, the, that's the same John. All of these are the same John. To me, I find that interesting. Okay, so in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. God okay so this that spirit of everlasting life the spirit of God is in those of us that are born of God therefore we have <laughs> really uh, we couldn't have a greater spirit in us All right so when it, Jesus says the keys of the kingdom. We have the keys of the kingdom. Right now we have the spirit of the kingdom in us. Right now. You know, think about that. I think, in my opinion, understood correctly. Um, you know, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. And you think, well, you know what? I sinned today. Well, you sin your flesh sin you we all live in this body of death really um you think about what paul wrote here let me find a verse real quickly here in romans 7 oh wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from this body from the body of this death right so we live in corruptible flesh, but we are born of a incorruptible spirit. And that spirit is what will deliver us to everlasting life. And ultimately, we will be changed on the day Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right, in Ephesians 4, verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. All right, the day of redemption is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are changed forever. All right, so when we are changed forever, then there is no more death, no more sorrow. So again, no man has an advantage over another man like what we see in this world. All right, so in John chapter 3, um, Jesus says that, what, that whosoever, where am I at here? All right, okay, right there we go. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All right, and he talks about, Jesus talks about um, when he, uh, oh, what's that verse? When he shall be lifted up, he will draw all men to him. Right there. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Okay, so 
Jesus has been lifted up into heaven. All right. So in the context of John chapter 3, this is in reference to when Jesus died, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return for us. All right, so when he returns in the clouds of heaven, then we shall be lifted up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When we are lifted up, we are changed. All right, we will be, we'll take off this corruption and we will put on in corruption. We will take off this mortal and put on in mortality. All right, so when... Uh, Jesus comes. This is what this means. Um, so he right now, he is drawing all men to him right now. Okay. It is God is not willing that any should perish. All right. So, oops. Uh, I think it might be the Lord uh, is not willing that any should perish. Okay. God is not willing that any should perish. So he, so all of us are born. Uh, we are all, I'm sorry, we are all created uh, with this need for a Savior. Uh, nobody's born perfect, right? So it's the will of God that all men be saved. But not all men are born of God. And of course, uh, that's the challenge that all men face in this world. And that is, are you going to trust in yourself? Or are you going to trust in God? Okay. Because it, uh, that's really your only choice. And we all need to come to that point to where we realize we can't do it. Only God can do it for us. And that's um, that's the will of God drawing us to him. And then, of course, the ultimate is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are drawn up to him in the clouds. Um, so this is happening right now spiritually and it will be finalized on the day that he comes in the clouds of heaven. And... All right, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. All right, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So, Jesus is clearly the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. He's the one that can save us. He is the only one. <laughs> and it's just silly, really, to think that the Catholic Church can save anybody. It's nonsense. But they've created this aura and they've got influence all around the world and they've gained all kinds of power and influence for a long time. But this is exactly what the Bible said would happen. Right? Uh, there's just a many, many examples to give. Okay. Oh, excuse me. I got one letter wrong. There we go. Uh, in Second Timothy three, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So things are getting worse and worse and worse. And of course, in Matthew twenty four, Mark thirteen, and Luke twenty one, we are told that. 
um, that except the Lord shorten those days, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So things are progressively getting worse and worse. And this is the way it's supposed to happen. Right? Uh, and that's exactly what we see in the world today. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. In Second Thessalonians 2, I talked about this this morning. Who poses and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he is God. Sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Speaking of the Antichrist. Now how does the Antichrist gain in power? Well, there must be a falling away. There must be uh, people falling away from the truth of God and falling away from faith in God and then putting their faith in idols and, you know, leaders and so on and anything and everything but God, right? And so this is, we're seeing this play out. And this is consistent with everything in the Bible. It's incredible. It really is. And, you know, again, think about in the days of Noah, there was only eight souls that were saved. Must have been billions upon billions of people living during that time, yet only eight souls were saved in the days of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, there wasn't even ten righteous. And so what happened? God destroyed those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and those cities round about because they were just full of wickedness. All right, and this whole world right now is full of wickedness and it's coming to an end and I, I think everybody knows really I do people deny it and in particular young people I think but man you, you gotta know this world cannot sustain itself and it will not sustain itself all right and then <laughs> You got to contrast that. If you understand that, now contrast that with the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has over 1 billion followers. How can that, how can the Roman, how can, if that was the Church of God, why would God have to come back? He wouldn't. There's over a billion followers, if you will, then there's really no need for God to come back anytime soon. And it's interesting here that um, the elect of God, we cry out day and night unto God. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry out day and night unto him, though we bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? That means there's going to be very few people saved when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. If God allowed things to play out as they are, there would come a point to where there'd be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So this, this is really inconsistent with um, the idea that the Catholic Church is the true Church of God. How many Catholics in the world? 1.378. Now think about that. Remember what I just showed you in Luke 18? Luke chapter 18. He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? If there are 1.378 billion saved people in the world today that are living, 
Jesus ain't coming back in your lifetime. He ain't coming back for a million years. <laughs> you can forget about it. Ain't no way he's coming back for a thousand, over a thousand. It's gonna, I mean, there's just no possible way. That's way too many people. But that's not what we're seeing. That's not consistent with the world that we're living in. This world is full of evil and wickedness and corruption at all levels. And again, in you know, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it tells us. It tells us very plainly that if God allowed things to play out the way they are, there would no flesh be saved. All right, and except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, he has shortened the days. All right, so this, this doesn't square up, man. It doesn't square up, does it? Well, there's a reason for it, and that's because the Catholic Church is not the true church of God. The true church of God is those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And here Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, that's the rock. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, so that's what the church is built on, that fact right there, that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, so, all right, okay, so I'm going to end it right there. So I appreciate this uh, question. Hopefully, maybe uh, that helped, uh, that might help you or help somebody, but I appreciate you talking about this.